I'm excited today that we have Clinton Lacey with the Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement with us today as a part of our monthly resource spotlight. Clinton is the president and CEO of the Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement, a newly launched organization focusing on supporting credible messenger mentors, community rooted natural leaders who have successfully navigated their own prior involvement in the justice system, who share similar life experiences with current justice involved young people and are poised to have transformative impact on an individual family community and systemic level and maximizing their impact around the nation. We're in for a treat today to hear from Clinton. And Clinton, I'm going to ask you um, the first question about equity. So how do you think about equity in your role and what does that mean to you? Wow, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be engaging in this conversation with you. And that's such a huge question because I think the issue or the question of equity um, really is at the bedrock and the foundation of the um, unresolved issues in our society, right, in this nation. And so when we think about young people and families um, and um, somewhat older, younger people, right, um, and the issues that impact them, right, they are multi-generational, they are historical, they are rooted, I think, it's fair to say, in the experience of communities, of families, and, and plays out in individuals. And so while we focus on particularly young people, youth and young adults who are impacted, directly impacted, involved in the justice system, um, we focus on them because we think they are among or arguably the most vulnerable people in our society because of the impact and collateral consequences of justice involvement and what that means in, in our society in terms of disenfranchisement and um, barriers to any viable you know, um, process or avenue for success. Um, but as we enter that door and focus on that population, it, as we engage people, it opens us up to their stories, their narratives, which are present but also historical, that are based in inequity, right? Um, inequitable housing, inequitable educational opportunities, right? The lack of civil rights and human rights, like historically, and there's certainly been progress over time. But if we look at every measurable area of human experience, or perhaps from another point of view of care, Right. If we look at education, if we look at housing, if we look at health care, if we look at behavioral health, if we look at justice processes, we see we see a disparity. We see racial ethnic disparity. And that then, to me, is such a foundational issue. Like there's inequity sort of built into the framework of our society that lives through and is perpetuated through institutions of power. Right government and otherwise. So I think that is the question. And I think what we're fighting for then is certainly on an individual level, a process of healing and restoration and connection to services and all the things we want for people. Um, but that's in a context of a larger fight or effort to achieve true equity and fairness, which, uh, which has, you know, never been the case for for large segments of black and brown communities and other marginalized people in our country. So true equity would be fairness. It would be the elimination of disparate treatment, right? Um, and it would mean, you know, equal opportunity, you know, that uh, that everyone deserves. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for that answer. And your your organization, um, the Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement um, focuses on that wholeheartedly. Um, mm -hmm. And so you're actually going to grassroots level and getting individuals, not only are you helping young people, um, but you're also helping the young adults and the adult mentors that you have because they're giving back to the young people as well. Think about advancing equity from your role or position um, what tools or resources have you found helpful um, to make that happen? Yeah, 
I think the sort of package, um, we might say, of tools and approaches um, can be described as uh, building the capacity of community and impacted community who have suffered disparities. And among those, the most marginalized people, credible messengers, those who have shared life experiences, right? Lived experience, prominent among those experiences has been incarceration and direct impact of justice systems. Not, not That's not the only experience and it's not a prerequisite to be a credible messenger, right? But it is obviously a prominent experience, but other forms of marginalization in terms of of, of, of what people have experienced in, in the way of um, um, you know various uh, experiences with the uh, with with education and housing and um, substance abuse and quote unquote gang involvement, right? So there's a number of shared experiences that connect to what young people are going through, but certainly direct justice impact is prominent among them. So I think then our approach at CM3. Um, which grows out of a body of work, which I'll, I'll talk about momentarily, is to build the capacity of these actors, of these leaders, of these um, community members and community representatives. So when we talk about building community capacity, community can be one of those sort of amorphous words, like well, who's the community, what does that mean? And I think Credible Messenger is, an, is, is one, we think an important one, but one important example of what we mean by community, like, and, and this this is an example among the most marginalized people who have suffered in various ways, similar experiences, right? Building their capacity to leverage their experience and to uh, build on their expertise and add to their toolbox and to their ability to have the kind of impact that we know they can have on an individual basis with individual young people, on groups of young people, on families, and therefore like the ripple effect on communities, right? So we're building capacity of credible messages. So that's our approach. So like the theory of change, of, of, of which is not the panacea or the only approach, but part our theory of change is if we can successfully invest in and build the capacity of credible messengers to have that transformative impact, we will see transformative change in the lives of young people, in the lives of families and communities. I would add one piece to that though, which is perhaps, and it's all challenging, but this one is particularly challenging because of the power dynamic to all that they, credible messengers and broader community can grow its capacity to have transformative impact on systems and institutions, mm. right? So there's a there's a growing comfort level with an acknowledgement of credible messengers' ability to have transformative impact on a particular young person or on a family or on a neighborhood, right? And we're seeing more of that in terms of investment in credible messenger work of various types from violence interruption work to intensive life coaching, credible messenger mentoring, right? Like a continuum of work. We're seeing that. What's 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 more, and again, not easy work, very challenging from a number of points of view, but what's, I think, you know, really um, an important piece not to lose sight of is the, the transformation of systems, right? So this work isn't just about helping a marginalized, troubled young person put them on a path of healing and restoration of success. I mean, that's that's major, right? That's bedrock to what we do. But it's also, like I like to say, we're not just here to help um, uh, heal or help heal uh, traumatized young people. We're here to heal sick systems, right? We're here to transform processes that are unhealthy for people so anyway, so, so so to the question and the approach is, is is capacity building. So that means training, even going back to recruitment, vetting, helping to ensure that people who are coming to this work have the appropriate level of readiness, wellness, and then a, 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 a ongoing process of training and professional development, right, of credible messengers to play this role because Transforming or healing sick systems is more than 
it, you know, it's more than just rhetoric. It translates into actual change in, in a number of ways. One way is by credible messengers working with young people who would otherwise be detained or incarcerated or placed out of their home. Um, by doing that work and developing capacity and organizations in the community developing their capacity to do that, that demonstrates the, the alternative. If not the present inequitable system, then what, right? And so I believe that our work is helping or striving to demonstrate the answer to the then what, what in its place, right? And, and we believe in its place can be viable community run, credible messenger led programs and initiatives that serve people who to a large extent historically and up until now are still thought by many to be only best served in secure settings or by systems. That absolutely, absolutely. I'm glad you said that um, because I think there's, there's often two trains of thought when you think about um, what community means, community mm -hmm. partners. And community, you know, a lot of system leaders in the past often thought that community partners were other system people who worked with the same young people. Yes. Um, and we push for transformation um, and healing systems. Um, we're pushing more to lean more towards those grassroots community organizations that have been in existence maybe for years that we've just never tapped into as a exactly. system. That's right, exactly. Um, and part of that for me, for us, um, has been so system culture change, right? So I we started CM3 after um, 10 years working inside of systems, right? So for four years, I was deputy commissioner of probation department in New York City, where we first launched you know, this iteration of what we began to call credible messenger work, right? And as you said, like, we tapped into a history and a legacy of impacted people leading organizations and doing work. Like, we didn't create that, right? But we were able to harness that body of work, that history, and bring um, some, some, some intentionally designed structure and training and development to it to help build capacity, right? To be intentional about really doing what you just said, like tapping into community to provide those um, services and supports, right? And alternatives to what we presently have. And, you know, so much of, and then uh, for six years after that, I was director of Washington, D.C.'s Department of Youth Rehabilitation Services, D.C.'s youth justice system. Um, and so in both experiences, it was um, critical from that inside point of view, right? Inside of the system to um, approach, to confront toxic culture, sometimes overtly so in a punitive way, more so what, what we encountered in New York City, um, but sometimes not as overtly toxic or you know, overtly um, or even as uh, punitive as such, but more subtle types of cultural dynamics that still didn't value community in the way that we're lifting it up to be valued, right? So moving from a punitive to a more paternalistic point of view certainly brought about better conditions and better approaches, but it still didn't lift up community as viable partners, right? So so, so, so what we uh, even experienced in DC and part of the cultural change there from a system point of view, right, was to say, you know, we're not just here to uh, be kinder and gentler and more respectful to community. That's good. We need to do that. But we're here to say, no, the community is more than the sum total of its pathology and its suffering and its crime and all the things that we know exist in the community. We don't ignore that, right? But there's more to it. There's there's resources. There are people. There are experts. There's knowledge and wisdom and perspective that needs to be leveraged, and it is it is it is hugely valuable. In fact, without that, we won't be successful. So that sort of takes the 
the culture to another place in terms of how systems define themselves. And so the reason why I'm pointing that part out is um, that's 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 an important part of the work then. You know, we had the opportunity to do it, opportunity to do it from the inside. But key amongst that culture change, I would say, was certainly a level of training and teaching and sharing. But I think the most impactful um, process in beginning to change culture, because that work is never done, right, um, was to literally and figuratively bring community to the table, right? That you can't tra train your way into equity, right? Or into fairness. You have to practice it with people and engage community in ways that you never have and create space and give some level of power to community to be present and active in order to achieve that kind of equity. And that was the, that was the, that was the journey. And uh, not to suggest that the journey was completed, right? But <laughs> right, the, the work yes. continues, but that was, that was the process, yeah. Absolutely. So can you talk about, so in all of the roles that you've had, like right now you're um, heading the Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement, you know, your experience in running the probation um, in New York and at your work at DYRS. So what do you think is the greatest challenge that you faced in advancing equity and how do you try to overcome those challenges? Yeah, wow, there's so many, but I do think that I would have to say, given the power dynamic and the, his, the historical and still to a large extent present paradigm, places such a huge level of investment and reliance on systems to be the, the fix, the cure, the medicine, the solution, right? whatever word we want to use. Um, and that, you know, I think about that process or, or that power dynamic, I tend to think about it and talk about it in terms of eras of, of, of youth justice or justice overall, so-called in our nation and our society. And, um, you know, talk about and think about the, the history of the, what, what I often call a, a punitive error, which was like sort of overtly um, harmful and punitive and destructive, um, rife with you know racial and ethnic um, disparate treatment, like in a very sort of ugly, open, overt way, right? In terms of you know over the history of what's happened to black and brown and marginalized young people, the native nations, the native American populations. Um, African Americans, uh, Latino, et cetera. Um, and, and of course, not to leave out of this conversation, you know, girls, gender expansive youth, right? Like there's, there's various things to talk about with regards to disparity. Um, and so I think about like, a, I tend to think about a reform era. There's always been reform movements in this and throughout the, throughout the whole American quote unquote experience. But I think, you know, in the in the 80s and 90s through, you know, such initiatives like JDAI from Casey and other initiatives that really confronted these questions head on, including the question of racial and ethnic disparity, right? And equity, right? Um, and, and so that 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 movement and others have have helped, national and local movements have helped to push systems. Some, many, probably not most, when we think about this, so many jurisdictions, you know, over 3,000 in the country, but have pushed many to raise the standards, right, um, of, of, of care, of, of justice, of engaging young people, et cetera, of behavior of probation officers, of the court, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and and that I feel like we're embarking on and have examples of and have an opportunity to push through through like another level from where we are, which is certainly an improved level from from the worst part of our history. But we're still confronting this very question that we're talking about today, right? So there's been so many improvements, decrease in populations of young people in systems, improvement of conditions of confinement, improvement of court processes, more alternatives to, to incarceration and 
diversion. Although that's an issue now, of course, regarding quote unquote violent violent it, it, uh, incidents. But with that said, um, still then to your question about the greatest challenge, the reform movement and part of what it's, it sort of needs to continue to push for is transformation that says that um, the community needs to be not just a sort of hopeful recipient of a better brand of justice and treatment and leadership, but partners in that process of defining what that justice process looks like, right? So no longer like the recipients, but the the designers, the co-designers, right? And operators of a process. And so that's just a different paradigm. And that's one that's challenging to systems in a number of ways, right? And so that's a huge challenge to 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 confront on the part of systems from state to state you have powerful unions that are you know fighting you know um very uh, ferociously against reform and transformative practices because they see it as a threat to their existence yes to their jobs to the apparatus right so the apparatus has improved, I think, in many ways, but it's still one which does not empower communities. So, right. So, how, so moving from a service paradigm, services have improved, right, um, for certain. But moving from a service paradigm to better serve the community to an empowerment paradigm that builds the capacity of community to do the things that systems forever have been trained to believe that's their domain right and so so the challenge is how do you get empowered well-funded regardless of their outcomes <laughs> right systems well-funded systems empowered systems to begin to shift the mentality and identity to say our greater value is not in making a better machine our greatest value is in empowering our community partners so that they can do the work that we've always thought we were supposed to do. But actually, right, healing and restoration and transformation and education and CBT and DBT and the, all these sort of evidence-based practices that define progress and growth and maturity and healing, right, for young people, um, and 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 those that are grounded in culture, I would say, appropriately grounded in people's culture, needs to really be embedded in community and led by community and led by who we're what we're saying is credible messengers have a particularly unique ability to engage and build trusting relationships to achieve that process. Right. So, how do you get systems to do to do that? Excuse me, is the question and one which you know we continue to grapple with. Um, but that I would say that's the biggest challenge. Many challenges in the community, like right, we don't want to romanticize community. Like it's there's divisions, there's tensions, there's right many many of which, in my opinion, are sort of perpetuated by the 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 funding paradigm. So you got organizations fighting for the dollars and you know trying to position themselves, and so there's a number of dynamics. Um, and there's, there's, you know, the community isn't a monolith in terms of its thinking, but it certainly is 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 monolithic, generally speaking, and it's um, sort of um, being dependent on systems in such a way that doesn't empower them to do what they can do. Absolutely, you've given us quite quite a lot to think about, um, and this this paradigm shift. Um, that, that we're all working towards um, to make a more equitable um, system for our young people. Um, so as as you think about what we've discussed and things that, that you shared, is there anything else you'd like for others who work with young people in the youth legal system to know about advancing equity from your perspective? Like anything we didn't touch on, ways in which your work intersects other areas, how other systems, decisions impact your role, anything you can think of you would like to lift up? 
Yeah, thank you. I think that um, this question, as you raised around paradigm shift, that I think, again, like the fundamental one way to frame it that we think about it is a fundamental shift on the current level of investment and reliance on certainly the justice system, but other systems of care, child welfare system, right, obviously intersects in a, in a yes. very important way whether we're talking about actual young people who are duly involved in both systems, families that are definitely impacted by young people, mem members in one or the other or both systems. Um, but um, again, a, a system child welfare that has such tremendous power and impact over families, right? And, and, uh, um, and, and so shifting the paradigm even there from you know, they talk about, they used to say the, the, the juvenile justice kids are the bad kids and the child welfare kids are the sad kids, right? The bad kids and the sad kids. But like these are young people in the same families and communities by, that are impacted by inequity at the end of the day, right? And so if we can um, respect and recognize the diversity of each individual, but begin to connect the dots, right? And, and move away from the silos, right? So justice is one of those silos. Child welfare is another. Um, but the, the behavioral health, right? Apparatus from city to city, county, state to state, right? Same families that are most marginalized and impacted and in need, again, right? So these different systems. So when you think about, again, we start at justice in, in terms of our work, in terms of prioritizing justice impact of young people, but as we work with them, I sort of think of like an inverted pyramid where as you come in, as you, it starts to expand because the experience and impacts of those young people, they've been touched by, um, too often failed by, or fallen through the cracks of all these other systems of care, right? right. Um, and so I think this credible messenger idea and approach or this paradigm shift to investment and reliance on community applies to all of these systems, right? These fractured, this fractured body of, of institutions and systems that are ultimately having, that are impacting uh, the same communities, the same most vulnerable young people and families. And so I would just say what's important, I think for us as we continue to advance this work is that we do so with the larger picture in mind that credible messengers um, are, should not be confined to or marginalized to be defined as, you know, certainly not scared straight or something like that, right? Where, where some people think it still is, um, or 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 just violence interruption, which is an important body of work, or any just one of these pieces of work, and not just in the public safety justice uh, space, but to think of it overall of what's impacting the village. Right. Yeah. And so there are all these systems then are implicated in this conversation. And so credible messengers um, who are community leaders and representatives, so credible messengers slash community empowerment, investment and capacity building, I think is important and can grow into all of these spaces. Credible messengers who are advancing people's connection to behavioral health. Right. Who are advancing people's connection to education. And we see this work growing in all these spaces. And I think I would just say that, that that's really important, that we have the broader view of this idea of investing in community capacity, because that then begins to shift the paradigm. And then there's the struggle for the resources, right? Um, for, 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 which, is, which, of course, is the difficult conversation, but one which we got to continue to confront. Because then I feel that by by that big picture approach, because there's inequity in all of these examples and all of these systems, right? Um, so that we don't lose sight of the, what has been the bedrock, you know, um, um, experience um, operating system of this society over time. I mean, there's been several improvements that we could talk about, but the fundamental inequity and disparity that our folks are experiencing you know, is exists to this day. And so I think that, uh, you, you know, your focus in raising the conversation about equity confronts that, that big picture in a really profound way. 
So thank you. Thank you so much, Clinton. Um, I appreciate your time um, being with us today. Can you share for our audience how to get in touch with you or the Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement if they wanted to tap you for additional questions if, that they have or to reach out for services that you guys may offer? Yes, uh, certainly. Um, so we are the Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement. And I would just say that we named ourselves as such um, we emphasize um, well, Credible Messenger being the broader sort of continuum of people with lived experience doing this work in various ways. We have played particular focus and emphasized since probation and in DC system and now in SEAM 3, Credible Messenger mentoring as an intensive, longer term life coaching, co-navigational support process, right? Which is part of a continuum, but one which we think needs more attention and more, you know, resources. And so um, just, just to emphasize that, but we're also here to help with regards to training and TA and just support and connection with, with all credible messengers and community folks, right? It's fighting for capacity and empowerment. Um, so with that said, though, we are, um, yeah, available and interested in making connections. We can, our, our website is credible, um, CredibleMessenger3.org. Um, and my email is clacy at CredibleMessenger3.org. Um, and we are really always open to and interested in connecting with people. One other thing I would share with regards to that is um, the word movement in our title was intentional to say that we want to contribute to and be part of this growing movement of work, right? That that involves a number of people, right? Those who may not define themselves as credible messengers, but still have huge contributions to make to this work, right? And so one of the things that we're developing as an organization um, and connecting to is this idea of credible messenger learning communities, um, locally, st statewide, and then sort of ultimately nationally, like a coalition, a network of credible messengers who are doing this work and, and other supporters of the work. Um, and so, you know, I, I say all that to say, certainly would love to hear from folks with regard to any specific interest or need that we may be able to help with, but also just generally so, right? With regard to this overall question, we'd be happy to um, look forward to speaking with folks about that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate all the questions on the conversation.